Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the Training Tippets podcast series. I am your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and a super warm welcome and a boat full of excitement that you're joining us here today. It's so good to have you with us on this podcast. This is part two of a special two-part series that we're doing on enrichment. If you missed part one, then don't worry. You can check it out on animaltrainingacademy.com, and I'll put a link to that episode in the podcast write-up as well to make it super easy for you. In part one, we talked about what enrichment means, what part animal training plays in enrichment, the importance of enrichment of your pets at home, zoo animals, and additionally in vet clinics. And then we heard about our guests' recent trip they made to China for the purpose of presenting, learning, and networking in the area of environmental enrichment. Now, in part two, we're going to be talking more about the process of coming up with new enrichment ideas and implementing programs for their use. We will talk about how to brainstorm new ideas, the importance of doing good research, the importance of goal setting with our enrichment, how we first offer novel enrichment items to our animals and how we evaluate if those items have been successful. We will also touch on the importance of safety with novel enrichment items and hear some stories from our guests' experience in working with a large array of different animal species in managing their enrichment programs. We'll then wrap up by discussing the direction that enrichment is taking and our guests' vision for what they want to see transpire over the next five to ten years. To help us out, our guest is Sarah Van Herpt from Wellington Zoo right here in New Zealand. And for those of us that missed the first episode, let me start off by giving you a little bit more information on Sarah's background and the really great stuff that she has got up to over her career. Sarah is a lifelong learner and this is clearly demonstrated by the qualifications she has under her belt. Sarah obtained a BSc in Ecology and Zoology from Massey University in New Zealand, as well as a Master's in Conservation Biology from the same university. During Sarah's studies, it really hit home to her that animal behaviour was her passion. She wanted to develop a deep understanding of why animals do what they do. Her master's degree examined how we can combine behaviour with conservation outcomes and Sarah studied the song of the native New Zealand kokako bird and how it changed in the presence of multiple dialects or languages. After completion of her qualification, Sarah landed a job at Wellington Zoo where she has been for the past seven years, caring for a large variety of different species including primates, birds, reptiles, invertebrates, small carnivores and hoofstock. At heart though, Sarah identifies herself as a bird nerd. Sarah's time at Wellington Zoo has also included a two and a half year stint as a vet nurse in the Wellington Zoo Wildlife Hospital after training and obtaining a certificate in veterinary nursing whilst simultaneously working as a keeper. Throughout Sarah's career, she's developed a keen interest in enrichment and has run enrichment projects and participates as an enrichment committee member at Wellington Zoo. She also worked alongside the Australasian Society of Zookeeping to help organise some shape of enrichment workshops at Wellington Zoo in 2014 with a Shape of Enrichment co-founder Valerie Hare. Following on from this event last year, Sarah was awarded a special Shape of Enrichment grant to talk at the 15th International Conference of Environmental Enrichment in Beijing, China. Sarah also shares her home with a rainbow lorikeet named Manta and Sophia the Cat. So once again, a very warm Animal Training Academy welcome to the wonderful Sarah Van Herpt. How's everything going today, Sarah? Yeah, good. Thanks, Ryan. It's good to be back. (laughs) Hey, we're going to dive straight in, Sarah. In part one, we talked about the importance of enrichment and discussed the definition of what enrichment is. This episode, we're going to talk more about the process we have to go through to create new enrichment items slash ideas for our animals and best practice when it comes to giving these items to them. So let's get started by maybe sharing a little bit of information about what I know has been a great source of inspiration and information, not only for myself, but I believe for you as well. And that is the Shape of Enrichment Workshops held at Wellington Zoo in 2014 that both you and I attended. Do you want to share some information on what these were for people listening and the kind of process that we learned about in these workshops? Yeah, so we had Valerie here come over, which was really exciting. She's one of the co-founders of Shape of Enrichment, so she really knows her stuff. And we had a workshop which basically went through the whole process of enrichment enrichment, what it is, how we do it. So it went through the whole process of what enrichment is and how we do it successfully. One of the things that I really took from it was the whole planning diagram that Valerie gave us. It's on the Shape of Enrichment website. It really hit home to me that a lot of people were and are missing the point of enrichment, which is goal setting. And they're just giving things without having an idea of why you might even want to give that item in the first place. What is your actual point of giving it? 
So we went through a whole process of making enrichment for some species at Wellington Zoo, which was really cool. I'm a big believer in it's not just the people looking after the animals that do enrichment. You can get anyone in your zoo involved, anyone in your vet clinic involved, anyone at your home involved. So the first step in creating enrichment is research. What do you know about that species? What is your cat's normal behavior? What is a cat's natural behavior? What might be normal for one individual of the species might not be normal for a different animal. For example, we've got two sulfur crested cockatoos at Wellington Zoo. One is hand raised, one is not. So we might look at different things depending on which one we are doing the enrichment for. It's all about knowing what's normal for that species, what their natural history is, their normal behaviours, but also what's normal for that particular individual. Once you've got a good idea of all of that, you've got to create a goal. So with my rainbow lorikeet at home, one of my goals for him is that it takes him longer to forage his fruit than to drink his nectar. So he has to work harder and spend more time foraging as he would in the wild to get to those really delicious fruits that he likes, like apple and grapes. Once you've got a goal in mind, you want to brain brainstorm and you want to have a really positive brainstorm don't shoot down ideas as they come up it's some of those crazy ideas that you think might not work that once you talk about them a bit further you might actually come up with a way that you can make it work so when you are brainstorming just everything goes down on paper there's no no this won't work or no that's not safe or anything like that you're just getting all of those ideas down so that you can look at it later on and see oh could we make this work could we make this safe so that's a really good time in your process that you can get others involved. At Wellington Zoo, in our enrichment committee recently, we were talking about different ideas of things and we had one keeper that had a behavioural goal for one of our tigers. And so what she's going to organise is a brainstorm session for our whole animal care team to come up with different ideas for him. So I'm really looking forward to that. Once you've got your ideas and they meet your criteria of your goal, then you want to start investigating them. So pick an idea and make a prototype. Test that prototype out. So when you give a new enrichment item, you don't just want to give it and walk away you don't know if it's safe or what the animal is going to do with it so the most important thing is to just watch and if you're not sure watch with you in the habitat if that's possible or watch in an area where you can easily separate your animal off from the enrichment if you need. Most zoos will have a enrichment approval process but I realise that with your pets at home and your, your pets at the vet clinic you might not have that so there's lots of different places that you can go to talk to people about it and get advice on different ideas. There's a Facebook group called the Exotic and Domestic Animal Enrichment and that's a great place to go. It's not just zookeepers, it's people running catteries and rehab centers and things as well and so you can bounce those ideas off there too so as i said once you've built your prototype you want to test it so you want to observe record did you meet your goal did you meet it in a safe way would you feel happy putting that enrichment in again if all of those answers are yes cool great you've got a new item that you can add to your repertoire if you're not sure about something go back see if there's something that you can change or a different idea that you can try and keep going with that process one of the most important things i think about enrichment is personal perseverance. If something doesn't work once, don't give up. Give it another go. Try at a different time of day. Try it in a different place in the habitat. But just keep persevering. Just because an animal doesn't want to do something on one day doesn't mean it won't want it in a few weeks down the track. And you've got to remember that not interacting is also a choice that you've given that animal. And it's seen it and it's chosen not to do anything with it. Cool. That's fine. That's just the animal's choice that you've provided for them, which is still really important. Awesome. Such a great resource and such great information. And I'll put a link in the podcast right up to the relevant shape of enrichment resources that you can find online. So you mentioned this enrichment planning and there's a enrichment planning diagram and there's a specific URL that you can find that diagram. So I'll link to that as well as the shape of enrichment website, as well as the exotic animal training monitor repeat the name of the Facebook group. Uh, that's the Exotic and Domestic Animal Enrichment Facebook page. Yeah, great. So I'll put a link to that as well so you guys can go there and check that out. For this next section, Sarah, I was wondering if we could elaborate on one of the specific areas of the enrichment planning diagram that you just highlighted there and maybe talk a little bit more about goal setting. Well, with my cat at home, one of my goals for her is to get her jumping. So not very good at it at the moment, but it's pretty normal cat behaviour. 
So what I want is for her to replicate that natural behavior of jumping to say catch birds. I have a toy, it's a mouse on a string. It's her absolute favorite toy. And so what I'm doing is sort of slowly increasing when I play with it, how high I go so that she can jump for it. So my goal is to get her a bit fitter from the running and a bit better at jumping. So that sort of side of things. With your animals at your vet clinic, one of your goals might be, as I mentioned earlier in the last podcast, is to get your animal to sit still. At the Nesta Kohanga at Wellington Zoo, our vet hospital, we had one of our servals in hospital. So we have got four servals at Wellington Zoo, two males, two females. So we've got the mother and father and their two offspring. And one day the father sustained an injury to his paw. So one of the things when we had him in hospital was to basically get him to leave the bandage alone. At first he was pulling it off because it was sore. He had an infection which once we got under control the removal of the bandage behavior kind of just became habit for him. So our goal was to decrease bandage interference so in order to do that we realized he's using his mouth to remove the bandage. So what other ways can we get him to use his mouth. So we gave him lots of food based or scent based items that we put around the habitat. So we would give him a small shallow pool filled with kangaroo bedding so it smelt different and occupied his face in that way. We hid his food around, put it up slightly high so he didn't have to jump but that he could reach it with that other paw and pull it down. We used lots of things like sardine juice around the habitat so that he was kept busy smelling those things instead of using his face to take his bandage off. So sometimes your goal isn't necessarily to do with the animal's natural behavior and it's about preventing other behaviors or increasing fitness and they're all just as important as each other. Natural behavior based goal might be something like for our Kia which is an incredible New Zealand parrot, extremely extremely intelligent and one of the things that they do is they use their beak to dig out grubs and bugs from rotten logs. So we provide them with rotten logs but we also provide them with different kinds of enrichment to get them using their beak to dig things out. So pine cones stuffed with treats are a really good one for that. And I was at work one day doing this and I thought, gosh, I think my cat might like that. So I went home with some pine cones and stuffed some cat treats into them. So my goal was to increase Sophia's foraging time for her treats. So rather than just throwing them down on the ground for her, put them in something. And she did. She spent a long time trying to get those treats out. So one of the important things about enrichment is that it's not just about how long you take to make the enrichment and how much effort you put in because sometimes it's just those really easy things that take a few seconds that will keep your animals occupied for a really long time. Yeah, really cool. And I like those examples. I'm just thinking about this serval example. Me and you have the enrichment planning design diagram open in front of us right now. And I'm just looking at that and mentally working through it in my head as you're telling me about this serval. So let's go through this diagram for that individual animal. We start on research. So we would research our individual species. Yep. So servals have an excellent sense of smell, really good eyesight, really good hearing. And to catch their prey they will jump they'll fish they'll pounce things like that with this particular serval our research for him is that he's in hospital with a wound and it's not painful anymore it's just that part of being in hospital and I've got something on my paw and I don't want it on anymore so our goal for him is to decrease bandage interference by increasing the time he spends doing other things primarily around his face so keeping his scent and ice and mouth busy so we had a bunch of possible ideas some of the ones we used as I mentioned were bedding from different species different ways that he could forage for his food just different things in that environment that particular individual as well going back to our research is very scent focused he very much enjoys anything to do with scent so to meet our behavioral goal of decreasing that bandage interference we did rely a lot on that scent that we knew he enjoyed using. So you researched the species, you researched the individual, you came up with a goal based on your research and the needs of that individual? Yeah absolutely. And then you brainstormed all the different kinds of enrichment that you could provide that could help you reach that goal. Yeah absolutely. When you're looking at your finalists and your prototypes and you're testing things one of the things that we did with him was that we used training. He is trained to stay 
fashion and he will tag it onto a scale so we weighed him very frequently and we sort of did that training with him however in terms of meeting our goal it doesn't quite meet it because that's quite a limited period of time during the day that we'd spend with him doing that we can't spend half an hour doing training with him he'd definitely lose focus and it's a lot of staff time whereas when we tried the bedding so straw or hay that had been in with kangaroos or wallabies or niala when we tried that with him it did meet our goal because he spent a long time with it much longer than we could offer him a training session yeah and in the brainstorming session we include all those ideas and we don't place any judgment about whether it will take time or not take time and then when we go through to the finalists then we'll go through that process of asking ourselves all these questions about what would be most relevant is that correct yeah absolutely so yeah brainstorm just get everything down and then we looked at um the keepers provided us with a list of enrichment things and we we had some ideas ourselves and so we looked through those and we tried what's appropriate in a hospital setting and what is going to meet our behavioral goals and then just tried it out so we still used training absolutely but it didn't meet our goal in terms of increasing the amount of time that he spent doing things other than pulling his bandage off cool and i like what you said there about trying things out and testing everything we mentioned so far such important areas of enrichment i'm so glad that we got you on the show today to discuss these things they're providing such amazing learning opportunities for all those out there and i just know that this information will really get people thinking about and building upon the current enrichment programs and schedules they already have in place let's ourselves build upon what you just mentioned there about offering these novel enrichment items to our animals how do we tell if we've been successful in achieving the goals that we've set up for ourselves how do we measure this observation is key so you need to actually watch what the animal's doing. In some situations, I know that that's not possible, especially if you are giving it to your pet, say, while you're at work. If you can't actually watch the animal and see what they're doing. Another way that you can tell if you've been successful is what's happened to the enrichment. Has the pine cone stuffed with cat treats that you've provided been moved around? Have the cat treats gone? Or has the item just sat there untouched? That sort of thing can be a really good way to tell if you aren't actually able to physically observe them. Yeah, and I just want to touch on getting more technical and advanced there. And I think what's important when doing this is not only knowing what happens after your animal receives the enrichment but what your animal's behavior is like before they receive the enrichment right because then how do you know if there's been a change in behavior does that make sense yeah so when we did the shape of enrichment workshops we kind of did ethograms which are a little bit advanced but can we maybe talk a little bit about what's involved in using this technology to measure behavior? Yeah, Ryan, absolutely. There are different levels of assessment that you can use to assess the effectiveness of your enrichment. And so we've got empirical, which is like a really formal way of doing it. Quite an involved study with lots of repetitive observations, which is great if you've got students, work experience students or volunteers that would love to help you out with that sort of thing. We've got the express method, which is more like a down and dirty way that we can do during our busy day it's like the empirical method but just a bit more relaxed on the rules and then you can just do an interaction rating the basics are really similar for all three levels of assessment you'll often do observations before your enrichment so that you can see if you've actually had a behavior change you use an ethogram to uh, look at what behaviors you're seeing so an ethogram is basically a list of all the behaviors an animal will carry out and how that's defined and then you've got your analysis so actually looking at your results and how you're going to do that it's a pretty massive topic though so i'm not sure i can go into it too much more now but shape of enrichment again really good people to talk to if you want to know more about the different kinds of assessment yeah great thanks for all that sarah this stuff is so important and i know in part one we started off with the comment enrichment is not just giving our animals a novel item there's so much more to it than that and we've definitely provided a lot of great information just now about all the really important important things people have to consider when implementing their enrichment programs. I get really excited talking about all this stuff. One other aspect though that we haven't talked about yet is safety. This is a big one for me because obviously the worst thing that can happen is we come up with a new enrichment item, we're really pumped about it, we offer it to our animals and then something happens. They, they get hurt or they get stuck somehow and we have to take an emergency visit to the vet. Can we now change the subject a little bit and talk about the importance of safety when offering our animals enrichment? Yeah, absolutely. So 
you've got an enriched environment which inherently means there is more danger but it's an accepted risk that we've weighed up and we act to the, reduce the risks and we try to imagine every way that our animal can interact with enrichment so for example with my cat Sophia I would make sure I gave her a pine cone that's big enough that she's not going to swallow with the safety concerns it's not only that the animals can injure themselves they can injure other animals, staff, visitors. They could escape or impede keeper access to their habitats. So you've got to be really aware of what you're doing and where you're putting it and where the animal might put it. There are some really common safety concerns. So hole size. If you're giving something like a boomer ball or anything that's got a hole in it, can your animal put its head in and get it stuck or its paw or its tongue or its tail or anything that it could put in can it get stuck is it going to trap something is it going to trap a limb or a digit or a head or an antler or a horn if it falls down or if it comes apart in a specific way does it have any sharp edges or points could it strangle your animal so being really aware when you're using rope and chain to tie up enrichment of if the animal gets that enrichment out or if it slips in a certain way have you made sure that it's not going to leave something that an animal can get trapped in is it something the animal can ingest what kind of rope is it is it natural rope that breaks down or is it an artificial rope which could lead to an impaction how heavy is it if it falls down is it going to squish something could it restrain the animal in any way could it suffocate the animal in any way there's some really common things that we don't use with enrichment we don't use anything sharp and metal so no staples in your cardboard boxes for example no sellotape no fraying rope no glass when you're using something like a cardboard box or some other material like that if you're putting blood on it or meat in it can that animal then eat that cardboard that's potentially not a very good idea so it's knowing your animal and knowing what risks are inherent in enrichment and balancing those yeah so important and i think things like frayed rope are potential hazards that really easily slip our attention and may be present in our animals environment for prolonged periods of time and i've certainly come across it in my experience lots of things to think about and there are alternatives to using things like ropes more natural alternatives as well can you maybe give us some examples of other things we could use is there anything natural like a uh, flax leaves or big banana palm leaves or something that you can use that's in the animal's environment that could make rope so sometimes wheel tie things with long strands of grass, for example, or tree lucerne. You're much more safe for the animals than using things like sellotape. Yep, absolutely. Hey, cool. We've got a couple of more questions to go through and then we're going to be wrapping up this two-part series. Before we do, though, what we thought would be fun is maybe if you shared some stories from your experiences and important lessons that you've learned along the way. Let's say the top two or three stories that stick out to you. Well, one that stuck out to me recently is the importance of communicating with your peers about enrichment. In our zoo we've got a bunch of new keepers which is really exciting and they're really keen to do enrichment so we learned along the way that one of our lions if given a whole ostrich egg has been known to get it stuck behind his teeth. So it was really good to have the experienced keepers explain this to the new keepers who then came up with a really cool solution for that animal to have that ostrich egg and have it safe for him. What she did was she weakened the ostrich egg so she put some cracks in it so that he'd be able to bite down on it really really easily and it was really awesome to see that lion just had a blast with that ostrich egg and that keeper made it safe for him so she did it while he was in his den easily able to separate him off from the other lion and watched him carefully and it was just a really cool outcome and I think that that's really inspiring and really cool to see. I love giving enrichment to individuals of the same species to see their different reactions in the way that they solve problems. So recently I used some natural fibre rope to hang up some beetroot in our kia habitats. Our kia love beetroot and what they did, one of them was to pull the rope up using her feet to hold onto it until she brought the beetroot up. However one of our other kia decided that actually the better way to do it was to use your beak like a pair of scissors and cut the rope in half so the beetroot fell on the ground 
down so that she could then fly down and eat it. I thought that was really fascinating just watching the different things that animals do and just because one animal is going to use enrichment in a certain way it doesn't mean that your next animal is going to also use it that way. It's really fascinating seeing their different personalities. And one other really cool thing that I, I really appreciate and enjoy is that enrichment can be really simple but be really effective and take a long time for the animal. So a few stories in that vein. I could go on forever. <laughs> We've got a group of five rainbow lorikeets. I recently got them a hanging enrichment. My goal was to look at their visual and sound preferences. So it had a series of wooden blocks with a bell at the end. So we could stuff food in the little blocks if we wanted or smear them and it's natural wood for them to chew on. But the bell is something different visually and for their hearing as well. I put this in. It took me 30 seconds to go in there, put the enrichment item in, then leave and I watched them. And before I'd even left, one of them was straight to it, rubbing himself on the bell and making it have noise, which brought in the other four. And I stood and watched them for a few minutes outside and they just fascinated with it for a long time, which was really cool to see. Things like forage piles, so big piles of leaf litter or bark chip. So many animals have such an awesome reaction to that. And it takes you a few minutes to put a bunch of leaf litter in a sack or put a bunch of bark chip in a sack, go and tip it out. And they're busy foraging through it for a long time afterwards. So enrichment doesn't have to be a completely involved process. It takes a long time, but it's just trying different things. Great stories. And so glad that we can all learn from and grow as a result of your great experience, Sarah. One more question before we end up for today. And this question is looking forward into the future. I'm really keen to know where you see enrichment heading and what you'd like to see happen in the next five to 10 years. One thing that always frustrates me when I see people talking about enrichment online is you see a lot of people asking, what enrichment can I do for this species? Which is great that they're seeking help. It's really good to see. But the question that we should be asking is what enrichment would suit this behavioral goal? Being online is a great way to get lots of people to help you brainstorm, but you should be thinking more about what your goal is and less about what the species is. That would be really important. And I'd love to see that happen in the next few years. A big drive for everyone thinking about the goals rather than the species. One other thing that I'm really keen on is lots of sharing. I want to see your videos of, and your pictures of the different things that you're doing and why you're doing them and what success you've had. But I also want to know what isn't going right because only from talking to each other and hearing each other's experiences will we actually get a really good idea of what's not working and what some of these safety hazards are that we might not have thought of before. So yeah, just a lot more conversation and a lot more focus on goals. Well, thanks for that, Sarah. These last two episodes have been so, so, so much fun to record. And I know you and I have been talking about the possibility of doing something like this for nearly a year now, I would say. So it's great to get you on here and make this happen. From myself and on behalf of everyone listening out there, I just want to say a massive thank you, Sarah. Really grateful for you taking the time. Oh, you're most welcome. I could talk about enrichment all day. For all of those listening out there, I hope you learned a lot and you can use this information to really supercharge where you are with your animals and use it to enrich their lives and for it to help move you towards more of those behaviors you want. As mentioned, I will link to part one of this enrichment two-part series in the write-up for this episode on animaltrainingacademy.com where you can also find all the other podcast episodes on offer. And if you haven't visited animaltrainingacademy.com yet, then get yourself there now. There is so much on offer for you as well as these podcasts. There are free lessons on positive reinforcement, environmental arrangement, building relationships with your animals, target training, crate training, clicker training, and loads more. All of these free lessons make up free training tidbits online course, which has video content, audio content, written PDFs, quizzes. There's stuff there to keep you busy for weeks. And on top of that, there's the free live web classes. To learn more about those, go to animaltrainingacademy.com, click on webinars in the main menu to find out when the next one is. And also, if you have an individual training project and you want a faster way to get the results for your specific situation, then click on the VIP mentor programs in the main menu on the website and click the blue link there. After clicking that blue link, you can book a free 20 minute video call consultation where you and I will organize a unique tailored plan just for you moving forward. Once again, to do that, just visit animaltrainingacademy.com and hit the VIP mentor program button in the main menu. For now though, that's it from us. 
thank you so much for tuning in and you'll hear from us again soon. Leave your comments about the episode on the write-up or on animaltrainingacademy.com or on iTunes. Tell us if you liked the episode or you didn't like the episode or tell us about some of your favorite enrichment items, and especially if you've had any failures as well as your successes. Either way, we would absolutely love to hear from you. But until next time, farewell. Arigato gozaimasu. Sayonara.